This is part three in a series of videos in which I'm looking at ferroresonant transformers. This is an example of a ferroresonant transformer and uh, in principle in terms of their build they're quite straightforward uh, but in the way they operate uh, it gets kind of complicated and it's quite difficult to explain so I'm hoping in the uh, few videos that I'm posting on this that I can explain how these devices work. I'll keep the explanations as simple as I can. I'll avoid any maths when I can. Unfortunately a bit of mathematics is inevitable uh, but I will keep it to an absolute minimum and I'll try to show how these operate through example rather than through uh, just calculations and, um, and figures on paper. So in this video what I thought I would do is uh, have a look at some of the waveforms that we see in a ferroresonance system. But before I do that I just want to have a quick look at the way that the secondary part of the transformer is driven into saturation. In the previous video I explained that the primary part of the core uh, was running in the linear region of the flux curve and that the secondary part of the core was being driven into saturation intentionally and that flat portion of the saturation curve is uh, the key to the self-regulation in these devices. Uh, but in this video I want to try and explain how that uh, discontinuity between the two parts of the transformer is produced. So before I start looking at the waveforms I thought I'd just do a, a very quick um, bit of uh, maths. It's going to be very brief, I'll keep it as simple as possible and then we can look at some of the uh, actual waveforms that we will see in a system like this. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, just to start with, uh, I thought I ought to mention I have simplified the wiring of this quite a bit. I've removed all the bits we don't need. Um, they made it look more complicated than it needed to be so I've got rid of quite a bit of the wiring but the actual uh, transformer and the ferroresonant part of the system is still wired in exactly the same way. I've just tidied it up a bit to make these explanations more straightforward. So I'll just move the camera, we'll go through a very brief bit of um, theory and then we'll come back and look at some of the waveforms. In the previous video I drew this diagram which is a representation of the physical structure of the transformer and I described how we have two separate sections of the core although it's a common core, they are um, separated to a certain degree by these magnetic shunts and the idea here is that it allows us to uh, control the two halves of the core in slightly different ways. So what we're aiming for here is to have the primary side of the transformer operating in the linear portion of the flux curve and the secondary side uh, is driven into saturation and by operating in the flat saturated part of the flux curve that is the key to the self-regulation of this type of transformer. Um, but the question is how does this actually work? And what we have is the primary and secondary are coupled through the core in a similar way to a standard transformer. The only difference here is there's a degree of isolation and that degree of isolation is uh, carefully designed into the transformer to give it the response that's required. Um, but there is a degree of isolation which means that the uh, flux in the primary part of the core is not necessarily the same as the flux in the secondary side of the core. And what we're aiming to do here is as the current in the primary increases we want to drive the uh, secondary part of the core into saturation. And so what we are aiming for here is a discontinuity between the um, primary part of the transformer and the secondary part and the way this is achieved is through the use of a third winding which is the resonant winding. So if we take this diagram and I redraw it as a schematic representation rather than a physical representation what we end up with is a transformer so we have the core I'll ignore the shunts for now, they're not important for this particular part of the discussion. We have the primary winding on one side, we have the secondary, and then we have the resonant winding. 
And as I said in the previous uh, video, the only thing connected to the resonant winding is a capacitor. So if we take this part of the schematic, what we end up with is this, which as I'm sure you'll recognize, it is a standard LC circuit. And any time you see a circuit like this, you know it's going to have a resonant frequency. So um, apologies, but a, a little bit of maths here. I'll keep it as brief as I can. If you take the formula for the frequency of oscillation for a circuit like this, what you end up with is FO, frequency of oscillation, equals 1 over 2 pi times the square root of LC, where L is the inductance in Henry's and C is the capacitance in Farad's. Now, looking at the transformer, you could probably hazard a guess as to what the inductance of the resonant uh, winding would be. Uh, we'll measure it in a few minutes, um, but just as a, a guess, let's say it's uh, 0.4 Henry's. So we'll make a guess and say 0.4. What I'll do now is I'll plug this into the formula. We know that C is 25 microfarads, that's written on the uh, capacitor case. Whether that's accurate or not, I'm not quite sure, but uh, again, we can measure that. But we'll assume it's correct. And so what we have here is uh, 1 over 2 pi times the square root of L, which is 0 0.4, times C, which is 25 times 10 to the minus 6. So I'll just calculate that and we'll see what the result is. So that works out as 1 over 0 0.0199, which is equal to 50.25. And the result is in hertz. OK, so that's a fairly good approximation. Um, we've come out at 50.25 uh, hertz. And it's going to be somewhere between uh, 50 and 60, I would guess. Um, but it will be somewhere in this ballpark figure. It's this kind of frequency that we're aiming for. And of course, what we're aiming to do here is have this circuit resonate at 50 hertz. So when it's given a driving signal through the um, core flux at a 50 hertz or 60 hertz rate, bear in mind that these transformers are very sensitive to frequency for what well, I'm hoping and becoming obvious reasons. Uh, then the idea here is that this uh, circuit will resonate and it's this um, back and forth current flowing through this uh, winding that is causing the uh, secondary part of the core to be driven into saturation. Okay, so what I'll do now is measure the actual inductance uh, of this winding and we'll see if we're anywhere close to the estimate. So I'll just move the camera back over to the uh, transformer. I'll get the LC meter out and we'll measure the inductance of this winding. OK, looking back at the transformer, I've disconnected the resonant winding from the capacitor. I'll get the LCR meter. We'll switch it to a, a sensible frequency. And we'll measure the inductance. Now, what we expect to see here is something probably slightly higher than um, what we guessed. I guessed at 0 0.4 Henry's and it came out at 50.25 Hertz. But normally these are set up to give a resonant frequency slightly lower than that. But um, I'm guessing it's going to be something between 0.4 and 0.6 Henry's, something like that. But we'll measure it and see. OK, as a reasonable guess, it's come out at uh, 584 millihenries, uh, or 0.58 henries. So I'll plug that value into the uh, formula, and uh, we'll see what resonant frequency we actually get. OK, so plugging that value into the formula gives us a resonant frequency of 43 hertz. So that's uh, well within the scope of what we would be expecting to see. So um, hopefully this is um, going to demonstrate that what we have here in the uh, resonant winding and the capacitor uh, 
is an, uh, an LC circuit uh, that has a resonant frequency that is fairly close to the mains frequency and that's what uh, this system is designed to do and the idea here is that um, when the voltage starts to rise in the primary then the voltage rising in the secondary starts to uh, excite the uh, resonant winding and then at some point we should see a very sharp rise in the current flowing in that winding because of the resonance uh, of the LC circuit and that sharp rise in the current in the secondary resonant winding uh, will cause the flux in the secondary part of the core to rapidly increase and that will drive it into saturation and it will do that on each half cycle so what we should be seeing are typical uh, current spikes um, going plus and minus uh, going into and out of this capacitor as the winding uh, effectively oscillates at the mains frequency and it's that resonating um, oscillation of current um, between the winding and the capacitor that generates the spikes in flux that cause the core of the transformer in the secondary region to go into saturation. So in other words, those high spike currents drive that region of the core into saturation, but the magnetic shunts prevent that saturated part of the core from uh, affecting directly the primary part of the core. So we'll now hook up the scope see if this theory makes any sense and if it um, pans out in terms of what we see uh, in the currents that we can measure and um, see if the, the theory starts to make any sense. So I'll reconnect the capacitor okay I'm going to attach a, a current clamp to the uh, lead going to the capacitor and the output from this will be shown on channel one of the scope so that's the yellow trace on the scope I'll just raise the camera slightly so you can see the scope better okay I've made a poor man's differential probe so I can measure the mains directly be very careful if you do that sort of thing I advise you don't do it at all but if you do that be very careful um, Dave Jones on the EEV blog has done some uh, videos about uh, how not to blow up your scope and um, as I say if you do want to measure the mains directly and be very careful this is not an isolation transformer so I do need to be uh, wary of that when I set this system up. Um, so what we're looking at on the scope is channel 1 which is the yellow trace um, will be the capacitor and uh, resonant coil currents and the blue trace is the mains input voltage and we should see that as the mains input voltage rises and gets to a peak we should see a uh, resonant um, function between the capacitor and the resonant winding itself okay so I'll turn on the power and Hopefully you can see on the scope that we do indeed get what are clearly resonant currents flowing into the capacitor, that's the yellow trace, and we have the uh, main cycle uh, shown in the blue trace. Now if I turn the load on, what we should see is the load varies is the phase relationship between the two traces should um, adjust, it should, should change as the transformer uh, adjusts to uh, effectively self-regulate and it's the um, side effect of the way that this um, increasing load on the secondary uh, affects the flux in the secondary region and then the way that that um, in turn affects the uh, rest of the core and that is what causes the self-regulation to occur um, all we're doing really here is running up and down the flat portion of the saturation curve in the secondary part of the transformer. So I'll start to adjust the uh, load and you should see the phase relationship between the two traces changing. 
So hopefully that's fairly clear that what we're seeing here is a very clear change in the phase of those two signals. You can also see what happens if you start going too fast. If we go outside of what the transformer can actually manage, uh, then uh, the uh, transformer stops functioning in its proper mode and the efficiency starts to go down. And the same if you go too far the other way. Uh, you lose the ability of the transformer to self-regulate uh, and also you're not running in the proper resonant part of the uh, performance curve. Again, vastly oversimplified the way that this uh, operates. Let's turn this off, it's a bit uh, noisy. It's one of the downsides of these transformers, they are mechanically noisy, they do buzz a lot. What I'm going to do now is something that uh, you shouldn't ever do with big transformers, is I'm going to short circuit the output. Uh, so I'm going to short circuit the secondary side of it and then turn the mains power back on. And the reason I'm going to do this is just by way of demonstration that this transformer does expect to operate in a very particular mode and if you take it outside of that mode then it ceases to operate like a normal transformer. Uh, that is if you stop the resonant um, operation of the cores then the, the transformer can not really transfer very much energy and we'll see that in that the response will be kind of the opposite of what you'd expect from a large transform like this. This is a big transform, this weighs about 12 kilos so which is a big hefty core and um, it can probably easily uh, transfer uh, four or five hundred watts. Uh, actually one of the benefits with um, ferroresonant transformers is they do have a very good ability to generate peak loads and um, that's because there's so much energy stored in the secondary part of the core. Somebody mentioned in the comments on the previous video about the possibility of using one of these in an audio transformer. Now in theory you can do that, there would be other problems to overcome, there would be various um, noise issues. Uh, also this would have to be very well uh, screened, these do throw out a lot of uh, electromagnetic interference. Um, but uh, having said that, because these have such a good ability to provide uh, very high peak loads, uh, without the ne need necessarily to have huge capacitors, uh, then these in theory would make very good uh, audio amplifier transformers as long as you can deal with the uh, other noise issues that they generate. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, short circuit the output and I'll turn it back on and we'll see if it uh, explodes. A uh, big transformer like this, if you try to short circuit the output, it's a 90 volt winding that can provide up to probably 10 amps or more. Uh, if we try to do that with a normal transformer then uh, we'd most likely blow the fuse in the auto transformer um, and probably burn out the transformer and we'd see smoke and uh, flames and death and destruction uh, all around us but uh, what we'll see here hopefully is something fairly benign. Okay so I've connected uh, a lead directly across the secondary winding it's a 90 volt winding probably capable of delivering 10 or 15 amps so if I was to do this with a standard type of transformer um, then we'd see huge currents being drawn and uh, probably a lot of smoke and um, uh, or noise but uh, what we'll see here should be something fairly benign. So I'll turn the power on and as you can see on the transformer no resonant operation in the um, capacitor and only 1.4 amps being drawn from the mains. So uh, very little power being drawn. Um, as I said, if you tried this with a normal transformer of this size, this would now be probably melting. Uh, we'd certainly be seeing a lot of smoke. Most likely the fuse would have blown, uh, but here you can see that we've uh, had almost no effect whatsoever. So I'll now disconnect this. Transformer hasn't been damaged. We'll turn it back on. And once again, we hear it start up and uh, it's giving out its uh, normal output. Turn the load on and we can see that it's still operating uh, exactly as it should. So we haven't damaged it, um, hasn't done any harm.
and again is a very nice feature of these transformers. Uh, having said that, if you do try to power them up into a highly uh, capacitive load where you need a big inrush current, then they may well not start up properly and um, may go directly into this uh, almost shutdown mode. Um, so that can be a problem, but uh, normally if they're properly rated for their application, then they do work extremely well. Okay, that's it for this video. Hopefully it's uh, taken us a step closer to explaining how these uh, ferroresonant transformers work. Uh, as I said, I've been simplifying the explanation, uh, but I can go into as much detail as you want. It does start to get a bit complicated from here on, but um, uh, in general, if you do want to use these, they're fairly simple to use. Just make sure you're operating them um, somewhere within their normal power rating. Usually you want to be operating them somewhere between 90 and 100% of their design rating. If you go outside of that, uh, then they'll either be inefficient or they'll start to overheat. But um, having said that, they're ultra reliable. If you need a regulated supply that's going to last for 20 or 30 years uh, without the danger of um, uh, lightning strikes or uh, over uh, current destroying electronics, these are an ideal solution because they're pretty much indestructible if they're used uh, within their proper operating range. 